In part six of the series, we learned about King Solomon. Solomon was a very interesting king. From him, we saw the heights of Israel and how Elohim established his great name and Israel's name amongst the other nations. But right after the rise, we saw the reason for the fall. Israel did not see the result of his mistakes until after his death, but Elohim prophesied and foretold what was to come. A theme you should have noticed from this series by now is that Elohim keeps his word. So we're now at the fall of Israel. Throughout the next two parts, you will hear two constant themes, a king who did right in the eyes of Elohim and kings who did not do right. You'll hear more of the latter, unfortunately. I find that this part of the Bible is not taught at the level it should be. The history directly helps us understand multiple points. The most important point is why Elohim preserved David in Jerusalem to send forth the Messiah. It shows why Israel expected a different type of savior than what Yeshua was. And lastly, this history shows the significance of the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28, because you'll see specifically that Israel did not follow Elohim as they were commanded. The main thing I want to emphasize is that Elohim is loving and understanding and gives us many chances. Israel kept messing up. Then he sometimes scolded them, and he also gave them a chance to fix their mistakes. They continuously made bad choices and later suffered greatly for them. It's the same thing we face in our lives today. We continually sin and provoke Elohim to anger, but he gives us grace and forgives us. But he does sometimes scold and reprimand us. Use these lessons to gain more appreciation, understanding, trust, and love for Elohim. Let's begin. So we ended part six with King Solomon and his transgressions against Elohim. He sinned massively, creating confusion and setting a table for Satan to take advantage. Elohim told Solomon he would not remove him as king and he would preserve the care of Jerusalem with Judah for David's sake. So the changes in the kingdom of Israel did not occur until Solomon's death. Solomon was king of Israel for 40 years. Before his end, Jeroboam, a servant of Solomon from the tribe of Ephraim, was met by the prophet Ahijah. Ahijah took a piece of his clothing and tore it to 12 pieces. He told Jeroboam, Take for yourself 10 pieces. And thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give 10 tribes to you. And he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because Israel has forsaken me. And Solomon did not do right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judges, as did his father. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I've made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David. But I will take the kingdom out of his sons and give it to you ten tribes, and to Solomon I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart's desire and you shall be king over Israel. And if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight as my servant David, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house. Solomon knew about this and tried to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam fled to Egypt. So Solomon later died and his son Rehoboam was now going to be king. His son Rehoboam went to a city in Israel to be crowned king, and all of Israel, including Jeroboam, went for the crowning. After being made king, the leaders of Israel spoke to Rehoboam and said, Your father Solomon made our burden heavy. Will you not lighten the load of service required of your father, and we will serve you? Rehoboam spoke to the elders, and they told him, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. He rejected that advice, though, and consulted also with his friends he grew up with. And they told him, make their burdens heavier. And that was the advice he listened to. Rehoboam went back to Israel and told them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now as my father put a heavy burden on you, I will add to that burden. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. When all of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, they said, What share have we in David? 
We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. And from this, Israel was in rebellion against the house of David or Judah to this day. There was no more united kingdom of the 12 tribes. Israel made Jeroboam king. He reigned over the northern 10 tribes. And Rehoboam was king over Judah and Benjamin. The capital of Judah was Jerusalem. And the capital of Israel was Samaria. Rehoboam wanted to start a war. But Elohim did not let him. So we are now at a point of a divided kingdom. Consisting of many different kings of both Israel and Judah. There's a lot of history amongst these kings, but for time purposes, I will not go over all the details. If you want more details, you can read about this all in 1st and 2nd Kings and 2nd Chronicles. So we have King Jeroboam of Israel and King Rehoboam of Judah. Jeroboam did not trust in Elohim and built his own shrines and high places. He made two calves of gold and told the people, Since it's too much to go to Jerusalem, here are your gods. They can be worshipped in Bethel and one in Dan. He made priests from every class of people, not just from the sons of Levi. He did evil in the sight of Elohim. King Rehoboam did evil as well. He did not prepare his heart to seek Elohim. Judah provoked Elohim to jealousy by serving other gods. They built them in high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which Elohim had cast up before Israel. Both kings did evil in the sight of Elohim. And this continued down the line of kings. Some did good in the sight of Elohim, and many did evil in his sight. Let's follow this chart. You can see from this chart the kings that served Elohim and the ones that did evil in the sight of Elohim. Like I said, if you want specifics on each king, I do recommend you reading 1st and 2nd Kings as well as 2nd Chronicles. The history is quite interesting. 2nd Chronicles is literally just another account of what you'll find in 1st and 2nd Kings. Some have different details than others, but this is the history of ancient Israel and it must be understood. If you want a copy of this chart, I will have it on my website for you. The link to it is in the description. So let's understand a few things from this. The first thing to understand is the kings of Israel. All the 10 northern tribes did a lot of evil. They all were found evil in the sight of Elohim. Each one seemed to be exceedingly more wicked than the next. The worst one seemed to be King Ahab. He was horrible because he had help. He took Jezebel, a daughter of the king of the Sidonians, as his wife. And together they set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Jezebel herself massacred prophets of Elohim. She was just killing prophets and establishing prophets of Baal. This is where we become introduced to the prophet Elijah. Elijah was labored a troubler of Israel because he spoke overzealously against the wickedness in Israel. He went to meet King Ahab even though Ahab was looking to kill him. Elijah told King Ahab, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of Elohim and followed Baal. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, as well as the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who all eat at Jezebel's table. Ahab agreed and did so. Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If Elohim is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. I alone am left a prophet of Elohim, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So here's what we'll do. Let them give us two bulls. Let Baal's prophets choose one bull, cut it into pieces, and lay it on wood, but put no fire under it. I will do the same with my bull. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of Elohim. The God who answers by fire, he is God. So they took the challenge. The prophets of Baal prepared the bull, called on the name of Baal from morning to noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, for he is God, right? Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or maybe he's on a journey, or maybe he's sleeping, and he must be awakened. So they cried louder, cut themselves until blood gushed out, as is their custom in the world of all devil worship, but no one answered. So it was Elijah's turn. Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. Elijah took twelve stones, 
according to the number of sons of Jacob. Then he built an altar in the name of Elohim. He put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah said, O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Elohim, hear me that this people may know that you are God, and that you have turned their heart back to you again. Then the fire of Elohim fell and consumed the burnt sacrifices. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, Elohim, he is God. Elohim, he is God. Elijah then said, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. And so they seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook and executed them. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had executed all the prophets. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. So Elijah went and hid in a cave. Elohim came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I have been very zealous for you, Elohim, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Elohim told him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Anoint Jehu as king over Israel, and Elisha as prophet in your place. It shall be whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elohim also told Elijah, in reference to Jezebel, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be refused on the surface of the field, in the plot at Jezreel. So they shall not say, Here lies Jezebel. So all of this was done. Ahab's complete line was destroyed, and Jehu became king over Israel. Jehu found Jezebel, and she was killed. Her flesh was eaten by dogs, nothing to bury. And remember, she asked for it. Elisha was made a prophet to replace Elijah. As they were both walking, Elohim called up Elijah to heaven. Another example of Elohim preserving those loyal to him. Now Jezebel is important to understand. This Jezebel spirit is a wicked one. She is notoriously known for being the greatest enemy of the prophets of Israel. According to Kim Daniel's Demon Dictionary, Jezebel is a spirit that operates by absolute power. Control and manipulation are at its foundation. All that was left of Jezebel after the dogs devoured her were her hands, feet, and skull. Her hands represent stopping the work of Elohim in our lives. Her feet represent being demonically led by her. And her skull represents mind control. She is overly controlling and you will often see that spirit manifest to drive people away from Elohim. There is also the Ahab spirit. This is a spirit that comes upon leadership to cause them to walk in the ways of the ungodly and to turn the hearts of the people towards idolatry. This spirit not only puts up with the Jezebel, but is also in total agreement with and works with the Jezebel spirit. You should beware of these spirits. Do not go against these spirits without understanding spiritual warfare. I will devote some teaching to this. I explain this part of the story because it's important to understand Elijah and just the extent to how wicked Israel was. They were worshiping Baal. Elijah is important to understand because he was one of the boldest prophets. In a very wicked time where it seemed all the northern tribes worshipped Baal, Elijah took belief in Elohim and challenged all of Baal's prophets, all the way to a point where he was hunted. If you parallel that to these times, I hope his story gives you strength. We are again in a very wicked time. It seems everyone practices some form of Baal worship. But if this video does anything, I hope that it builds up a bunch of Elijahs. Men and women confident in the God they serve and ready to stand up against the Baals. Elijah was protected, and you are too, if you put your trust in him. Elohim took care of him because he was loyal to Elohim. His heart was good. I pray that strengthens you to ask Elohim for protection because of your overzealousness for him and your intolerance for Baal. Preach the good news and expose wickedness. But there's so much to this part in the story, I had to split the information up. The points you need to understand from this part are 1. Because of Solomon's sins, 
the kingdom of Israel was taken from his line. 2. The ten northern tribes split and were now known as Israel. 3. Judah and Benjamin were only known as Judah and it was preserved because of Elohim's covenant with David and him choosing Jerusalem as his city. 4. The kings of Israel all did evil in the sight of Elohim and worshipped Baal. 5. Elijah, a prophet, stood for Elohim, challenged the prophets of Baal, and won, later executing the prophets. 6. Elijah was called up to heaven for his obedience. Part 8 will continue with this story because there is much more to understand. I hope this summary gives you good information and encourages you to read all of this on your own. This is truly remarkable information. This is pure history, and if people just knew this history, I feel it would directly defeat many people's stumbling block in their belief. But what I pray for most is that what it has done is raise up bold Elijahs prepared to be overzealous for Elohim and plead the blood of Yeshua over everything in their lives. Thanks for watching. I love you all.